Frida, join me today in welcoming the brilliant Sonia Kamal to this submarine where we dive deep into story and impact. Sonia is a powerhouse storyteller celebrated for her award-winning novels, essays, and captivating talks. Her latest novel, Unmarriageable, hailed as a gold standard of Pride and Prejudice adaptations, has wowed readers worldwide. It's the Financial Times Reader's Best Book of 2019 and a favorite of NPR, New York Public Library, and People Magazine. It was even named one of Georgia's books all Georgians should read. Sonia's work has been published in leading outlets like the New York Times, The Guardian, and The Atlantic, and her acclaimed short stories have earned nods from Claudia Rankin, Long Reads, and Vela. She also curated No Place Like Home, a striking collection on South Asian borders and identity. Her TED Talk, What Will People Say?, unpacks cultural expectations while her powerful address at the U.S. Citizenship Oath Ceremony, We Are the Inc., speaks to the real American dream. An inspiring educator, Sonia has taught creative writing at Emory Ogledorp and around the world. Born in Pakistan, raised in Saudi Arabia and in England, and now based in the U.S., Sonia brings a global perspective to her literary voice. Hello, Sonia. Welcome. Hello, Farida. Thank you so much for having me on the slow drive. Wow, that introduction was incredible. It's um, it's always interesting to hear introductions because I'm like, oh, really? Is that me? It's just, it's just, it's 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 so wonderful. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And I'm so excited because, first of all, I love writers. Uh, I read a lot of books. Producers and writers, creators. It's just, it's amazing. So we're just gonna. So thank you. But we're going to dive right in. Uh, we have a segment that we start off with called Icebreaker Questions. So you were really, uh, you were up for this and you're like, let's just be completely spontaneous. So we're being spontaneous today. I didn't give you any yeah. of the segments in advance. So no. we'll be surprised together. <laughs> All right. Okay. What childhood family recipe warms your heart? Oh, you know, there are so many. I cannot choose a single one. I have an essay actually in the New York Times called Plating Memory because I think everything that we eat from childhood, whether a loved one prepares it or we prepare it ourselves, the, the memory that we have of the recipes, the ingredients, the scents, the smells, the colors on the plate, it's literally when we eat from memory, when we eat from childhood or any stage of our lives, we are literally eating memory. And um, there are just too many. My father, my late father now, his um, his love of uh, dal chawal, rice and, and yellow lentils. My mother with her Kashmiri background, again, of um, hak chawal, with, which is um, white rice, but this time paired with greens. My Kashmiri grandfather and his making Kashmiri pink tea in the tedious hours-long process it actually takes. And just so many, so many things. Um, I look forward to actually wondering what my children in the future, once I'm dead and gone, might put in their memory, in their plates and plating memory and what foods they eat. But yeah, very difficult to choose one. For me, um, you know, all sorts of things are, all sorts of food bring up some sort of memory. Have you made any of those recently? Your mom or your father's <laughs> recipes? Have you cooked any you know, of those when I, it, Yeah, I, I, you know, my father, my mother's recipes, there's so many recipes from relatives, fat, loved ones and everything, even chai, even the making of chai is so interconnected culturally that it's part, it's not like something special, you know, it's what we eat every day. But like I say in my essay, Plating Memory also that, you know, whenever I miss my parents, whether it was you know, across the geographical divide because we live in different countries or once someone passes away, whenever I miss them and I need comforting and I need a hug, I, I do, you know, when I'm eating dal chawal or when I'm eating roti uh, dal, which is my father would have his bowl of, he, he was all, he would always end his meals with a bowl of um, the yellow dal and then he would break a roti, a chapati into it and mix it up. And I cannot eat for several health reasons, chapatis and stuff, but I can still take it and break it up. And then I feel like my father's right there with me again. So, so yeah, it's part of our culture. It's part of our 
culinary every day, but it's also very much a way to connect across several divides with one's family members, with one's culture. That's what food is actually at the end of the day. Oh, so and see, I expected that eloquent, beautiful answer from you <laughs> because you are such a you're such a uh, dynamic writer. I was like, yes, I can visualize the bowl of lentils and the roti and the bread, and it's like, okay, now I'm hungry. I want to bowl. Of lentils. What is that? Is your? I, I I'd love to have a conversation oh. here. What is your oh, favorite? My, gosh. my mom recently passed away two months ago, but oh, she, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have so many recipes that I learned from her, but, uh, yeah, so I don't have one either. So, uh, uh, Sonia, yeah. I don't have one either. Um, but yeah, I think it's Palau. I make a really good lamb Palau that I learned from wow. my, family, wow. my aunt and my mom. Is, is, is that the, is that the Yachni Palau? Yes. You know, yes. the one that, yeah, mm-hmm. yes. That's a favorite of mine too. I make I, it with goat though. Yeah. yeah, same here with goat or lamb. Yeah. And although now yeah. I'm a pescatarian, yeah. uh, but if I have like a dinner party or something, my my guests aren't <laughs> pescatarian. You know, I'll still serve them. Out, if, you, if you eat shrimp, it turns out very well with that too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Never, that's interesting. Okay, well, great. Well, we'll have to trade recipes. Oh, well, maybe you can share a recipe and I'll put it on your your show notes uh, for one of your favorite recipes, <laughs> especially the Kashmiri guy, because I haven't, I, 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 I'm awful at that. I, because I just okay. make, you know, like, un- unmarriageable, in unmarriageable, a lot of the, th- one of the themes in it is uh, how marriage connects to food and recipes, because oftentimes in traditional cultures, women have been sold into marriage via the foods they cook or can't cook and what it means to be a good cook. You know, apparently love and all that stuff is through the stomach of a man. And then, you know, so how do women get in? In Asian cultures, we don't cater to the heart. We cater to the stomach often. So I can give you a recipe from Unmarriageable if anyone's yes, out there wanting to yes. get into whatever through that. I, yeah. I, I mean, this is, we're going to have to have a second conversation because yes, we have like a supper club to, to uh, accommodate your beautiful book as well, which we'll talk about (laughs) a little bit. Okay. What is a song or album on your playlist currently that you've listened to more than three times? You know, I, 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 I tend to listen to songs to work out and dance. I'm a huge dancer. I find my spirituality and God and universe and source or whatever word you want to use for that through dance, um, which might culturally be a little uh, paradoxical. But for me, from early childhood, dance has been my way of, of finding awe in this world. And honestly, I'm very much a South Asian music person. And often that comes into film music. Music because that is what we've grown up with and that is everything. So often I have something from the olden days. Um, so very much I will listen to, song, you know, something like as simple as um, Vahida Rahman, Dancing on Guide, Aaj Phir Jine Ki Tamanna, which translates oh, wow. to Today I Want to Live Again, Today I Want to Die Again. It's, it's a beautiful, I think, meditation of a song on what it means for the human spirit. But also in more contemporary times these days, I'm listening to... Um, what did I this morning? What did I? Uh, I? I get up and I dance. I always dance on two, three songs. This morning it was um, it was very contemporary, but um, oh, I forget the names of it. There's this one South Indian song. I don't know what it means, but I love the tune. It's Achacho. And I did a little Instagram a reel on that also very recently. But I think that's the beauty of music per se is that even if we don't know the words, it's it's more the it's the tune and the beats and the lyrics. There's something so universal. I don't think any art really has the universality that beats do. You know, just just mm-hmm. heartbeat even because we all we may not know the words. Like I, t- I like I often uh, when I'm listening to music from across the world, I'll I'll contact a friend or someone and I'll say, what are these words I'm dancing to? I hope they're not too foolish because the beat is just it just <laughs> resonates so much so no, uh, I, i've been listening to and just um you know from um just a whole host of no, uh, movie I, songs. I i love that you said that even where uh we don't understand the lyrics it's a different language we've uh, music is a vibration so we can resonate with the vibration yeah. the harmony yes and i'm going to after our session today Share those songs with me in an email and we'll add them to your show notes. So <laughs> we will dance together to them. The, okay. recipes, the recipes and the music we'll add. Okay, okay, so we're going to move on to our first segment, 
So uh, the first segment is called Stage of Life. Who are the characters we meet? And I thought, you know, Sonia is this prolific writer. She's oh, uh, <laughs> she's creating these beautiful worlds for all of us to like submerge in and like connect with these characters. So I'm just going to ask some very open-ended questions and feel because you said you wanted to be spontaneous. So you all we'll just have that conversation and go with it. How's that? That's okay. Fine. All right. How would you characterize enduring love? <laughs> Enduring love, how would I characterize it? Um, I would characterize it as a cloud which changes shapes as it moves across the world. And um, love, and, and oftentimes, while the cloud may be love itself changing shapes, depending on who's looking at it and what cloud formations and shapes that cloud takes, as well as I think for me very much, honestly, I, I often see love as, um, as water, you know, but the different forms of water, ice and steam and rain. And then within that also, the sort of different rains we have, monsoons and drizzle and everything. Love is, love is constant, but the shape of it and how we feel within its borders and within its vessels, that's constantly shape, changing, you know? I mean, you can wake up and feel intense love for your pet. And then when that silly pet poos somewhere and you have to clean it up, that love is still there, but it's taken on a different form, which is the form of hopefully not yelling at it, hopefully caring for it enough because, you know, that is love too. I think for me, the purest instance of love is someone whose accidents you can um, bodily accidents you can clean up after you know care which is why the role of caregivers and nurses and people who are going to you know even something you know when your parent grows old one of the hardest instances of love i think is suddenly finding yourself in the role of caregiver but especially the first time you pick up a spoon to feed a parent of yours because they can no longer feed themselves that role reversal I think is one of the hardest things your spirit has to contend with because having to dab your parents or, you know, we, we do that with children and suddenly your parent who has been your parent parented you your entire life. And suddenly you have to dab the corner of their mouth because they maybe can't do it themselves. It is, it is that cloud has changed shape. That love is still there, but that cloud has changed shape and time has moved on through it. So to okay. answer your question, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Um, in that caregiver <laughs> role with parents, the follow up to that, because I think you, it's true. Um, how was it the first time you had to uh, uh, look at your parent like a child, and you realized now you were in that caregiver role with them? How was that first time experience like for all, all the caregivers out there who probably are with aging parents <laughs> as well? So, so I want to say there's two type of caregivings, at least for me. Perhaps there are several more, but for me they break up in two categories. One is the emotional caregiving. One is the physical caregiving. I think in South Asian households, um, unfortunately, oftentimes we find, especially more traditionally, our parents sometimes can be a little immature. And often we are cast as children in South Asian households into parenting our parents at an age where we don't even know what parenting means. And yet that is the role we've been thrust into. And we quickly have to grow up in many respects when we are cast in that role, if for those of us who are. So that's the emotional side of uh, parenting. Do I think it's a good thing? No, a child should remain a child as long as possible and be parented rather than having to parent. But then the second part of being a parent is the physical role, um, which is where your parents, you know, if they do lose the ability to feed themselves or go to the bathroom themselves or just physically take care of themselves, that parenting thing. My father was um, unwell before he passed away. He, he had cancer. And um, I went back home. I went back to their home in Pakistan to help out for a little while. Um, and um, the first time, like I said, I fed him. It was a very, very, I think I've always emotionally been a parent in many respects, as well as having to parent myself culturally, uh, because I didn't fit the mold. I was very unconventional. But, but this physical aspect of caregiving, I think um, a lot of us don't realize how early we are parents to our parents and to sometimes other adults. Uh, but uh, it's more this physical aspect uh, that suddenly, you know, 
is it's, it's more tangible. We can see it, you know. So suddenly we realize, oh, we're parents. The roles have changed now. So was that like a turning point for you? It was like a rite of passage. Did that like, oh, like after that, you know, that time when you saw your father and you had to feed him and you're like, oh, wow, his condition. Needs- you, you know, yeah, I think it was a little unnerving to begin with. Um, and it was more medicine. He could feed himself and eat and everything. But I think it was more the medicines where he, you know, we wanted to make sure that he'd gotten the full dose and hadn't forgotten and everything. So my siblings and I were very much on top of it. Uh, and um but yeah, uh, but I think for me, what was what was actually harder to come to grasp with and come to terms with was more the emotional aspect. Because I think with physical, like I said, it's more tangible. You can see the need for it. You can see everything. But I think when you are thrust in the role of emotional parenting, it becomes it's it's much uh, it's it's something you have to grapple with. Especially if you're a child or you're a teenager, no one really teaches you this. You know, culturally, we're not we're not taught that we are uh, that a child can be a parent and what that means so you teach yourself yeah. right when it, when it comes to owning medicine into someone's mouth we all know how to do that right we've done yeah. that for ourselves also but when it comes to emotionally parenting someone and that to adults in, in um it, it's it's a it's a learning curve and a very hard think, one no i think this is a, a this this strikes with me as well and i share a little bit of what you're saying i connect with that because i think parentification in South Asian cultures, especially with females and daughters, it's very easy to be the emotional caregivers, sometimes to mostly moms, but then also in general. And I think that's something that stays with you. Like you just always are emotionally pouring into people, even when you're not quite, you know, there. Uh, it, it, it's a culture that does not a really understand boundaries and borders within relationships and number two it's a culture that not just doesn't encourage it actually very much discourages it in south asian culture we are all supposed to be i mean relationships are fluid but even within fluid relationships there should there, there's i mean flu, the, the sort of fluidity that is encouraged in south asian cultures is one where there are no boundaries or borders whatsoever mm-hmm. people are sometimes grown ups are telling you very inappropriate stuff sometimes you know you it's it's or you're being you know the whole concept of tolerating things and bardash uh, karo you know um which Ever. means Patience. tolerate and, <laughs> yeah and just endure <laughs> that, that, yeah, endurance. Like you, you'd ask, what does what what does enduring love mean to begin with? You know, and and just to circle back to that, enduring love in South Asian cu- cultures doesn't mean enduring love as in everlasting love. It means endure whatever sort of love you're supposed you're given because you're not supposed to question it. You're not supposed to want better. You're not supposed to you know you you're just supposed to um, tolerate and accept whatever form of love is given to you and um, be grateful for it and um you know you endure love in in our culture oftentimes right yeah that's the question we were asking how uh, because i i do think that plays into a lot of these like complicated characters and relationships whether they're in books or in real life that we meet along the way okay so thank you for that uh Mm -hmm. do you think villains are just misunderstood I, I think that uh, I th- I think misunderstood by whom by them to, are they by, misunderstood by, do they misunderstand uh, themselves or yeah misunderstood by the ones who categorize them as villains or the villains in their story yeah they're they're villains in real life and then they're villains in books okay we can enjoy mm-hmm. villainy in books but but when it comes to real life villains within our lives it's 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 not that easy to it's it sometimes people can hurt us what is what is a villain i mean first of all i think i would say what is the definition of a villain in real life versus a villain on screen or in a book um you know as a writer as a novelist myself the only way i can write a decent story, book, anything, is to be able to see all my characters, including the villains, as whole characters, right? I can see why they're doing what they're doing. Everyone, the honest truth is, everyone thinks they are the hero of their life and their own story. Very few villains think they are the villain of anyone's life. That said, there is villainy and there is villainy. I 
I will say that a serial killer, a rapist, um, you know, p- p- pedophilia, there are people who engage in such villainy that even if they don't see themselves as the villain, there is no way that anyone else cannot see that they are the villain in a larger way than just someone who, you know, cut in front of you in line or or, or yeah. said something snide or snubbed you socially or something. So there are different types of villains and villainy. However, you know, we are we are all we are we while we may be our own hero always we are always also i think at some point in time the villain of someone else's story no matter the best of our intentions uh we may not even know it sometimes you know but that said i'm i'm giving very airy fairy and um, an answer to this question because um Villain, you know, when I was growing up, I remember people would say, who's the goody and who's the baddie in the story? The world was seen as very cut and dry. You know, there's a baddie and there's a goody and the protagonist and the antagonist. And the mm-hmm. thing is, as a, as a writer who thinks very deeply about her characters, even the secondary characters, the, the, what what is a villain and what is not depends on which lens and perspective we're looking at things from. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that whereas I'm the hero of my own story, I may well be the villain in someone else's story. Whether I am the villain rightly or wrongly, again, is a different topic. But nevertheless, someone can look at me and say that, you know, for whatever reason, I'll tell you sometimes it might be an odd thing to say, but often you may be the villain of someone else's story because they are feeling jealousy and envy towards you. And they might not know that it is their own character which has turned you into the villain. So villainy is so much more complex. But yeah, like I said, there is villainy and then there's villainy. Yeah. I actually love that. Uh, you said airy fairy. I don't think airy fairy at all. I think this is a really <laughs> great uh, deep dive because I think one of the w- wonderful things about speaking with a novelist and a creator and a writer like yourself is that you do spend so much of time uh, building these real people in your books, and they're they're all fragments of. I'm sure they come from somewhere. Maybe not one person, but like you see that in human in human wow. nature. But I would say. How do you, the last question uh, to follow up this, how do you reconcile, if at all, being the villain in someone's story? Like, for example, for context, like uh, I've been, and I think all of us at some point have been misunderstood. You don't know if you've offended someone. You don't know if you are the villain in someone's story. But let's say you kind of do know. And do you reconcile that or do you just let it go? Like, in general, I'm just curious i i will say oftentimes um if it comes to social circumstances you do know if you have offended someone no one is naive after a certain age you know say Mm -hmm. giving snide comments being rude snubbing someone etc not including someone othering someone i think after a certain age everyone knows what that is what that what that means and and if they proceed to do it i i don't think they're that childish and if they have done it unintentionally there's a word called sorry or there's commiseration you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt anyone who thinks that they have intention unintentionally hurt you know if you're intentionally hurting someone you're intentionally hurting them if you've unintentionally hurt someone pick up the phone say sorry you know it may not mend anything but what it may do it may you know it may not mend a hurt heart but what it will do is allow i think that hurt heart to find a little bit of healing you know I'm sure I have been the villain of many stories. I hope I have not intentionally been the villain of someone's story. But if someone looks at me as if I have values which someone else doesn't agree with, of course I'm going to be the villain in their story, right? But that's not my doing. And it is not my responsibility then to take any onus of that. So, yeah. No, (laughs) But if I I have hurt someone intentionally, I do want to say, if I have intentionally hurt someone... I'm the sort of person who can't sleep. And if I have for anyone out there, I'm so, so sorry if I wounded you in any way. It was never my intention. So, Sonia, that's beautiful. I, 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 and I also not, not, it is going to be a very cathartic episode for us, but I also say that something I've kind of put into my practice is just to forgive everyone every day. And sometimes, like for me, for me, and and it, it depends on like I I don't I it's 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 for myself because, and I think forgiveness and saying uh, you're sorry is humility. 
it 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 grounds you as an individual and it makes it re- reminds you of how fallible you are and that it, it's a level of grace that you exercise for yourself and then for others of course that's on a spectrum like we're not going to forgive someone if they well, you know yeah yeah i i hear you it again for you know but but the thing is i think it's i think what has really really lost favor in with with the world with humanity with people seems to be a concept of humility and i don't even make mean fake humility where people are humble bragging or whatever what i mean is that you know the, the, the artists i think and creators often walk and i think maybe that's why most of us i hope are tapped into that we often walk a very fine line a tight rope between thinking we are great at something and yet having to be humble enough to know that we are also fallible you know so that tight rope between success and failure success and failure rejection and and getting somewhere whatever it, it's a tight rope we come i mean i can go around the world thinking i'm all that and i'm so great and oh my god there's no one unto me which would be ridiculous but um but on the on the flip side of it to go around life thinking i'm the biggest failure and i'm the this and i'm the that and woe is me that's not right either so walking that line of humility and 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 um you know and being confident in oneself but i do think that humility we're we're so fixated these days on success and money and materialism and wearing all these things that humility really seems to have taken a back seat like hum- yeah. humble people are considered to be silly often stupid and mm-hmm. you know and you're right they seem stupid but i i call that quiet confidence i think someone that is yeah. like a, That's an a, excellent a, way to put it quiet confidence people who don't and i've been in amongst company of amazing wonderfully talented dynamic individuals that are just very quiet and it's always the one that's the loudest that's either and not always actually that's also on a spectrum i mean but um because i I can be pretty loud sometimes um but no quiet confidence is it's 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 an underappreciated trait but i love that i i'm around i I, I don't I don't think quiet confidence clashes with loudness. Mm-hmm. Bragging loudly or quietly is still bragging. Being loud, laughing loudly, being flamboyant, wearing your red proudly, your red shoes, your red lipstick, you know, historically red, wearing um red lipstick or red whatever has especially lipstick in many cultures red nails red lipstick has been seen as you know harlot behavior and this that and very loud and good women don't do this and whatnot and um and the thing is i i so i don't i don't consider being loud and laughing loudly and just being loud in your appearance as um not being humble you can have a lot of that in itself is quite confident so i always tell women i always tell people you know having been told growing up several times don't laugh so loudly what will people say (laughs) don't you know don't 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 you know as a woman don't give your opinion especially when i was younger and stuff and um I, i i learned that being loud is in cultures where you are are traditionally supposed to be quiet and docile and demure being loud is not being loud or arrogant being loud is a superpower and a strength you know it's not just um so depending on which culture which scenario you find yourself whatever loud is its own quiet confidence well i love that we should put that on a t-shirt and you should put it on a t-shirt and I will and put I it will, in my I next wear, one. I actually got a t-shirt, put it on a sweatshirt because I live in sweats when I'm also creating. Okay. Them. I, I, I love, love that. that. <laughs> I'm going to copy and paste that and send it to you. Okay, we're going to move on because um, this conversation is moving fast and I'm like, oh my God, we got to get all your... I, Second segment is, Ooh, is we do a part two. <laughs> yes, we, well, I think we will have to because I don't think we'll get to everything today. <sighs> Inspirations and reflections from your work. So I want to read something from "We Are the Ink," uh, the essay you wrote, um, and I'm going to read it for our listeners, a, a part of it, and then we'll speak on it. Today begins a new page, a new chapter, a new book of the story that is your life. Today, your stories become part of the American dream and also the American reality. Today, that dream you had one day gaining the right to cast a vote in the way you see this great country run, today, that dream becomes reality. 
As immigrants turn citizens, no one is more excited than us to receive summons to serve jury duty or to vote in elections. We know that a democracy is only as strong as the voices and votes of its citizens, and every single voice matters, every single vote counts, be it national, state, or local elections for president, governor, city council seat. Naturalized citizens or by birth, our voices and votes are equal. How do you feel about this two days after our election? <laughs> I, uh, love this. I love this. I was like, oh my gosh. This is a hard one. This is, this is, um, this is so, um, and the reason it's a hard one is because this particular uh, uh, piece that you quoted from, I was invited to be the keynote uh, to a citizenship oath ceremony. And um, and I and it was uh, absolutely delightful because I got to give out the citizenship uh, certificates to everyone who was um, sworn in that day, which was which was just its own wonderfulness. As a you know, uh, it was just wonderful. Um, the The theme of this piece was um, very much that immigrants we bring skills, our hopes, our dreams to the countries we immigrate to. We may, some of us, many of us, come empty-handed economically and hope to build a money future in the countries we come to. But oftentimes, we are not empty because of that. We do bring dreams. And a lot of the dream is to make this country that we have joined into a better, happier, more functioning society for everyone. Um, you know, so that was the part that was the whole thing of this that immigrants don't come here empty. We come with so much, you know, so oftentimes like uh, we come we come with a lot of love and a lot of hope and a lot of dreams, which is why we immigrate to the places we immigrate to. Um, it, it might be very controversial to say this, perhaps, but you know, when you are born somewhere, you might not even appreciate everything you have in that country versus when you choose to eat to immigrate somewhere you choose it's a choice um so politics and how people are governed in all countries all over the world um seem to have become a little more confused a little more murkier i don't necessarily i i don't think the u.s really um even though we all have the right to vote and we all do cast a vote, it is not a democracy by majority. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, it is still very much electoral college, which was a throwback of what, um, centuries ago. Uh, so there are certain states which have uh, their votes are counted. They have more of a vote count per se in aggregate than than a one-on-one -on -one vote. Is there any perfect democracy anywhere in the world? Perhaps not, but at least in the US, since we seem to go by electoral votes rather than dem democratic votes, uh, we see a very different vote count often than what is, um, what is, uh, what is actually cast. That yeah. said, Sometimes the whole thing with democracies and votes, and you know, I remember uh, as a child in um, in in school and stuff. You know, should should lunch break be five minutes longer? Half the class. You know, the thing with the democracy and with vote count is that there's always going to be one or two people who are not going to be happy with what happens. I think the biggest challenge to a democracy or to any place um, that wants. Um, to keep the majority of its citizens happy is to accept whatever votes have been cast. Do not challenge. Do not say that things have been rigged if they don't go in your favor. Do yeah. not. And when they go in your favor, you don't want to do any um, added, um, you know, investigations. But when they don't go in your favor, you do. So I think what is in, what should be integral to all democracies, no matter who comes into power, and that is the beauty of the U.S. also. So far, the U.S. in many countries around the world is that one country which has shaken hands and passed the baton on to whoever has won. Now, those citizens who are born in the U.S. might not see what a wonderful thing that is. But for naturalized citizens or for people who have lived in other countries, also even American citizens who've lived in other countries, must remember that being able to peacefully pass on the baton 
every four years or whenever the voting takes place is the strength of a democracy and is the strength of a very, very vibrant voting culture. Yes. I And I, I say that I'm going to link this article because I think we're all feeling a little, some of us are feeling elated. Some of us are feeling confused and a little dismal this week. And um, this, this, um, I mean, if we, if we were to talk about this particular uh, moment in time, which I, I don't know if that is the subject for this podcast, but it mm-hmm. is something which, um, you know, it, every every four years, there's there are people who are glum and people who are excited and I hope that whatever experiment, whichever country decides to be multicultural, multi-religious, multilingual, more power to it. It is a very hard experiment because um, humans tend to see differences than more than they do similarities. As a writer, it is actually my job and my duty to connect, to show those similarities, because at the end of the day, we're all human. But mm-hmm. it is a very, very difficult um, task because as humans, we seem to be more fixated in what divides us rather than what unites us. Right. Yes. Well, we're going to, I love that. Sonia, we're going to talk about reclaiming the dream TED Talk, the land of if only. <laughs> I listened to that and relate to it. And I uh, relate to it, the land of, oh, is it if only? But then yes. also then <laughs> taking action from that and then reclaiming it. So what what was the place that what was the place that you're writing from? And uh, and you talked about your your you wanted to be an actress originally, right? That was your first yeah. love was performing and now you're a writer as well. Um what do you want the audience to take when you're writing that and when now revisiting it? What do you want someone to take from that piece? If there's one so takeaway. Yes, you're quoting from my TEDx talk, mm-hmm. which is called What Will People Say? Because, yes. um, again, coming from a culture which is um, obsessed with reputation um, and what will the foundation of a good and bad reputation rests on what will other people say? What will people say? What will strangers say? What will anyone say? What will they think of you? Um, I did not have any agency or autonomy in my own life decisions um, for 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 the longest time. Uh, I did want to be an actress, as I say in my TEDx talk. Um, I watched a certain film, and I that film made me want to be an actress. And funnily enough, it was during while I was writing my speech for my TEDx talk that I realized what it was about this particular film, Omrao Jan, which made me want to be an actress. And what it was that um, the film has social issue themes. It's about colorism. And I think in my child mind, I was 12 years old, I thought that, oh, this is the way to social justice. This is the way that you talk about things that matter in society and can change society and make it better. I didn't know any better. I thought acting was, the, because that's what we see on the screen, right? We see the actors emoting, the actors carrying the, their various characters and, and changing the world and stuff. So I thought this is the way to do this. And so that's, I think, so my, I think my, so so my want to be an actress was not to just flit on the silver screen and, you know, and, and dance around trees because it was this very film, this very socially conscious film about prostitution, colorism, um, good girls, bad girls, marriage, who gets married and is respectable, who becomes a prostitute and is therefore disrespectable. This, you know, it, it struck me that this was the film that made me want to become an actress. And I wasn't allowed to be that because given my culture, my father, my late father said, um, it, and, 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 you know, to, to hear everything, please do listen to the TEDx talk. I don't want to do the whole TEDx talk here. Yeah, no, but no, no. You asked to revisit, no. Yeah, but you asked to revisit it. Um, and what was the impetus for writing that? I have lived, you know, the land of if only means if only I had done this, I'd be happier. If only I'd done this, I'd be more fulfilled. If only, if only, if only. And and part of if only is the regret of not doing the thing you wanted to do because you think grass is going to be greener on the other side. And 
who knows if it will be or not, right? We always, when we think of the other side, grass is greener, we always think we'll be happier, more fulfilled, more successful. We actually have no way of knowing because we haven't lived that life. We could be huge failures. We could be very, very unhappy. We may be living our best life right now, but we're thinking of some other life. But the thing is that when you don't get to have the autonomy and the agency to make your own decisions, which in South Asian cultures and more traditional cultures oftentimes women especially do not. And I want to say here, oftentimes men do not either. Um, I, as a feminist, I uh, very strongly speak for both women and for men, because as much as the women obviously may well suffer more financially and economically, oftentimes men suffer for their dreams also. If you have a, if you have a man who wants to become an artist, oftentimes you'll hear his family saying, no, you have to be an engineer or a doctor, or whatever, because you are the provider. There are many men in the world who don't want to provide. But, you know, they're controlled in that way because that is their gender role given to them. Women have different gender roles. Women might want to be the provider, but they're told no, barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, you know. So so it's for me, it's very fluid. Gender roles and the expectations in traditional societies are, are, are very, you know, they're both, they're fixed oftentimes for both men and women. And um, the land of if only for me is very much the land of regrets, where if we did not choose the life we want to live, we're always looking at the life we could have lived. And because of that, sometimes we might not realize that perhaps the life we are actually living is the best life. And honestly, it's the only life we have. We may as well try to make it the best and make the best of it. But oftentimes where I was so seeped in regret for so many years of my life, decades where I was like, if only I'd become an actress, if only I'd become an actress, that I honestly lost sight of the fact that this is my present, this is my life, this is my now, and I need to learn how to be happy within this life that I'm living rather than, but you know, like I've also said, culturally, I wasn't given that agency, but my parents took it away from me also. And um, how to love people who have taken away your dreams from you. A lot of my work and my writing addresses this question about how to love a culture, how to love parents, how to love family, how to love anything which you are told has to be loved. And yet they are the ones that have caused you grief, regret. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will speak on that just a little bit because I, I do think it's a very empowering, uh, reflective piece, your TED Talk, I listened to it. And for me... Um, mm -hmm my my connection to that is is that if someone does take your agency away there's a there's always another dream there's another goal also you can reclaim it or you can make peace with where you are because you said a, a, you just you can make peace with where you are because we don't know because i think there is something called future addiction where people <laughs> get caught up like they're not in the present what's in front of them and not, I'm not saying one person, you or me or anyone, just in generally speaking, it's possible at times where we don't appreciate what's given and we're all, always in the future. So something I'm trying to instill in my life is just to stay present and be like, okay, these are the cards that were dealt with me. This is what I can make of this situation to my best ability, even if there are some deterrents or roadblocks. Is it that important for me to go after it? Do I really want it? And what is the why for why I want it? Because sometimes yeah. we don't even know. And maybe we, some of us are very clear, this is truly what we wanted, but we were truly set back. But what is that why behind it? And I think that's a deeper diet. That's a journal entry. That's a meditation. That's probably years <laughs> of contemplation for any of us, right? Yeah. But because I it's I yeah, I just want to also add that I think you can, we can live, and I very much try to do that in gratitude. And as far as the uh, uh, now or present is concerned, the fact is a present or a now is really a fusion and a confluence, a meeting point of past and present. This moment, this that I'm speaking right now is already past, but a moment before it was future, it became the present. And like I said in my TEDx talk, time is just, it's always fluid. It's always fluid. And what I love about memory is that memory, we time travel. I call memory time travel. 
you know, because that's what we do. Close your eyes or keep them wide open, but you can go back to your childhood. You can go to a future you don't even know yet. We are constantly time traveling through our feelings, through our emotions, through our memory, through everything. You touch something, you know, you, you opened with food, you know, that is food is time travel. That's all it is. Food is time travel. Also, everything is time traveling. We are always constantly time traveling through many different lives, through projections, through what we've lived, did not live, everything. Um, but the thing is, with dint of that, even though we li- you, one can live in gratitude for what one has, but one that doesn't necessarily mean that one cannot also live in the regret of what was not allowed one. And the, the key word here is choice and allowed. You know, if you, mm-hmm. you know, I did a stint of modeling back home and people often ask me, how come your parents said no to being an actress and then modeling? Because unfortunately they waited for others to do things and then suddenly it became okay for my family. You know, if a cousin did something, then I could do it. I was never allowed to be the leader. But so I did a little bit of modeling and um, I hated it. I hated it so much. I spent four hours in that makeup chair and I remember even the makeup person said you will never be you know this is not for you because you are this is this is not a career for you and so but I tried that you know so you'll never hear me regret saying oh I never tried modeling and I wasn't allowed hated it being there done that hated it the thing with not having the agency to try something is that it was not your own decision and when you haven't made your own decisions and then life takes you uh toward certain um you know toward to, to in certain journeys by dint of other people's decisions and controls and 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 choices it's not your own so of course then one is going to ask did i choose that would i have chosen this life would i have whatever and it becomes a very dissatisfying life because it wasn't your own choice you can be happy in your life but you can still have that thread of wondering because it wasn't your choice yeah no a very very powerful uh testimony and words there because uh i think I think this speaks to a lot of us. Um, I personally, I, I was, I was very rebellious and there's a payback. There's a, there's a payback or a consequence for reclaiming your narrative and saying, well, I'm still going to do it anyways. And I, I did do that, but there, there was a payoff. Not everyone's going to like you. And you may be like isolated from the group or the community. And that's what I had to reconcile because I, I, I also culturally, it's, it's hard. So like either you be liked and you stay in line or, or you do that. But everyone's just situation is different and everyone's um, deterrence and roadblocks and whatever are also different. And that's extremes too, right? So we don't know. Uh, but I think for women in America, like for women, at least for me, it's like, who cares at this point? Like, I, if I had a daughter, which I don't have any kids, but if I did, uh, I, I would definitely say like I rather raise a rebellious daughter who knows her sovereignty <laughs> than to tell her what to do with it because the resentment yeah. that shapes your personality and takes away precious time too. Make mistakes, fail forward. I think I think as I'm saying, sort of empowering talk, and I think a lot of us take a lot from that, a lot of insight from that, Sonia. And I think one of the wonderful things about you examining everything, they show up in your work. And to we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to say, um, we will have to have you back. With, but we, we didn't discuss unmarriageable. Um, I'm just going to do a little quick little summation. And if you'd like to share, I was going to say, unmarriageable uh, is a beautiful book. And it's uh, it's adapted by our mutual friend, uh, who, Sadia Ashraf, and hopefully it will be in production uh, sometime soon, and we'll be able to see it. What? Yeah, it's being made into a it's being made into a film, and um, there was you know there's there was a lot of interest once the novel came out, but I very much wanted um, whoever produced it, whoever made it, to be as true to the novel as possible, given I understand, you know, book to screen, of course, books are different. And then you have to compress things within two hours, hour and a half, however much time the film. So not everything from the book can be translated. But for me, being true to the book as much as possible was very, very important. And also that the story should not change, you know, and Unmarriageable is set in Pakistan. It has Pakistani characters. um, And it, 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 there were, there were, uh, uh, 
people who were interested, who wanted to change it into perhaps an immigrant story or bring other things. And I held on to my, you know, I held on to my boat, no matter which uh, waters I was swimming in, because I knew very much what sort of a film I wanted to uh, have made and very much who I wanted to trust with the story and stuff. So, you know, fingers crossed. I'm looking, I, I think, I think the whole production team and, and everyone involved with it so far is, is just wonderful. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing on Unmarriageable, the film, and um, very excited about it, finally, and that we can finally talk about it, too. So Yeah, Sonia, I, I so appreciate you being so generous with your time today, and I will definitely have you back, because we did not cover <laughs> everything. And I, I knew that was going to happen, because you're such a, a deep diver. You're a prolific writer, and you have so many wonderful insights and wisdom, and I knew there was an hour wasn't going to be enough time with you. So I just want to thank you for um, joining us. I do want to say uh, we have, I'll ask you one question and then we'll say our farewells. It's a reflective question of the day. What does it mean to appreciate something fully? To appreciate, it depends on the thing again, you know? I mean, I think, I, I think everything at the end of the day everything and by thing i mean a meal or a you know something that is ephemeral by nature uh follows um the law of diminishing returns to you you that first bite that first sip that first everything you appreciate it fully and then slowly it's sort of you know there's a time when you're satiated and you're like i can't have another bite i can't have another so there's that you've all you've appreciated it fully but now you're done with that appreciation but in emotional terms and terms of human relationships to appreciate something fully is to always be in that state of that first bite or that first sip because when it comes to relationships which are not things they're people they're different from you know food or clothes or fashion or you know which i love and i'm big in you know i mean it's like for me films i can watch a film eight million times if i love it same film same dialogue like books um you know, some people read multiple books over and over again and i think to appreciate something fully is when you can return to something and in terms of a book or a film or a song or whatever, and just you, you keep appreciating it. And that's when you appreciate it fully. But with terms of human relationships, to appreciate something fully is to have trust and, um, and loyalty in it. Uh, you know, I think um, for me, any relationship uh, to appreciate something fully is for me, I think really, I, I think for me, the two things that are so important in the world have always been, you know, I've been othered so much. I am the queen, I call me, you know, I've been othered by every community on planet Earth. I kid you not. My own, every community. Um, I've always been very different, very unconventional, always. Um, for me, the litmus, the, the North Star of everything is kindness. Kindness, kindness is at the end of the day, you know, people talk about love, people talk about hope, people, all of those things are wrapped up in kindness. If you can be kind to yourself and to others, that's all that matters at the end of the day. That smile, that the smile that you gave a stranger or someone gave you, which might not mean anything to your day, might have transformed that other person's day so miraculously and then the butterfly effects of that that go on. Look, we are all prone to being unkind also. Like we said, villains, whatnot, everything. So I don't want anyone to think that we should all live in sainthood and stuff. We're human beings. But whenever you can practice kindness, whenever you can, go for it, practice it. And whenever someone is kind to you, someone who lets you know, oftentimes, if I'm standing in a cashier line and I've got 50 things and someone behind me has two things, I will let that person go through. And I cannot tell you what it does to that person's face because they're not expecting that simple kindness. But you know what it does to me? It does the same thing to me also because kindness is not some whatever. We are kind because it makes us feel better, but we've made someone else feel better. And if I'm going to, you know, all I can say is that kindness is a two-way street. You might not think it is, but you will feel better. The other person will feel better. You will have left this world a better place. Just kind. Just be kind. Be kind. Always choose to be kind. Now, my husband, if he's here, if he hears this, will say, what is she talking about? Hey, <laughs> I'm 
as kind no. as I can be. And he and is I'm, very kind too. <laughs> I'm sure my ex-husband will also say that. <laughs> No, I'm not my husband. Is, uh, people no, I'm come just into our lives. I say in unmarriageable that people come into our lives in order to recommend books, but you know, people also come in to our lives in order to for us to be kind to them and for them to teach us kindness. It's always True. a two-way street. We're, well, yeah. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that's a great final closing thought. Uh, so go spread that social contagion and spread kindness <laughs> and appreciate everyone fully while they're in your life. Thank you so much for joining us, Sonia. I am going to, we're going to link all the resources, your essays, the books, the music, the recipes, everything that was brought up in our conversation. And I'm going to have you back, God willing, with Sadia after the movie is done. And then we can talk more about Unmarriageable and I'm following you everywhere, so we'll we will continue to be each other's fan. Well, I'm actually your fan, so we will continue oh, to um, you know inspire one another. You. I'm and, and likewise, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you for this lovely conversation and such marvelous questions, which uh, you know they they made me um, think, which always makes me happy. And um, your slow dive is a deep dive, and it's a, it's 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 somewhere where you know. I hope everyone enjoys our conversation. Thank I think you so they much. will. I think they will. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed the slow dive, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you get your podcasts. The slow dive is hosted by Farida Rafiq, edited by Drew Francois. Our theme song is "Dive" by Sarah. Thanks for listening.